For these histories tell of a mighty power, which unprovoked made an expedition against the whole of Europe and Asia, and to which your city put an end. This power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean. The story was a legend in its own time, told not by some half-educated conspiracists, but by one of the greatest minds of all times. For it was Plato who wrote how, two generations before his, Solon, the great Athenian lawgiver, travelled to Egypt, where he met with the priests of the ancient temple of Sais, who appear to have kept historical records that were lost even to the Greeks themselves. Back in Athens, Solon was counted as one of the seven sages of Greece, but the Egyptian priests laughed at his ignorance and told him a phrase that has since remained in history. Elines ai peves este. You Greeks are eternal children. And while modern Greeks can sadly relate with this statement, what the priests had in mind was not a character trait, but the short memory that Greeks appeared to have, forgetting most that has come before them. So the priests decided to refresh their memory and told Solon a story, the story of Atlantis. But thousands of years later, we find ourselves in no better place than that of Solon, doubting that a story that predates our official history could be anything but a legend. And while it's uncertain whether Plato himself who included this conversation between Solon and the priests in his own works, had planned for the story to be taken as fact or metaphor. The reasons for which we're so convinced of the latter might betray not our knowledge, but our greatest fear. That for all our progress, soon, our civilization will too sink below the waves. Given its popularity, one might easily come to believe that Atlantis was a staple of Greek mythology. But in fact, it was only ever mentioned in two of Plato's work, Timaeus and Crito, often considered parts one and two of a larger work. According to this text, it was Solon, a real historical figure who lived during the early part of the 6th century BC, who brought the story back to Greece. Even during his own life, Solon was celebrated as the great lawgiver whose laws paved the way towards democracy. Right after giving his laws, however, and knowing full well how volatile Greeks are, Solon decided to travel abroad, increasing his knowledge of the world while making sure that no one could force him to revoke any of his great laws. In the Delta of Egypt, where the stream of the Nile parts in two, Plato's text revealed. There is a city called Sais, where the goddess Neith had her temple. It seems that both Egyptians and Greeks understood that Neith was in fact the goddess Athena, and so, worshipping the same deity, the dwellers of Sais and Athens felt like spiritual brethren. To honour their common ancestry, then, the priests decided to tell Solon a great story that happened not a few centuries, but 9,000 years before. This date alone is enough to disqualify the story in the eyes of modern historians, as the earliest civilizations that we know of go only as far back as the first agricultural revolution that is thought to have begun thousands of years after the date proposed by the priests. Egypt itself, at the time the story was retold by the priests, was no more than 3,000 years old, and Greek culture is believed to have started even later. But while the numbers suggested by the priests that take their story to the year 10,000 BC appear astronomical, the problem is not simply one of dates. Because when looking at our history, we moderns see not just events, but a story. A story we call progress, 
the story that we believe is continuing to unfold to this day. According to this story, humanity is slowly becoming a better version of itself, progressing towards higher and higher forms, while with a better understanding of the physical world, better technology, and even better moral. So how could Atlantis, a city that reached its pinnacle, only to be lost forever, fit inside of this story? And perhaps even Solon had his doubts because the priests told him that you Greeks are eternal children as you have no real knowledge of tradition, your science being just as young as you are. Otherwise, they continued, you would have known that neither Greeks nor Egyptians were the first to build cities on the face of the earth, since mankind has been destroyed many times, some by great fires, other by the ocean's waves, while those who survived took refuge near the rivers or high up in mountain tops, beginning anew the project of human civilization. The Athens then, that you call home, O Solon, is not the first, but the second to have existed. And even after you gave your wise laws, it remains but a shadow of its former glory, as it once stood against the greatest power the world had known, a mighty city built on a gigantic island beyond the Pillars of Hercules, modern-day Gibraltar. Atlantis was built on an island, perhaps as big as Australia, that has since sunk below the waves, and Plato gives an extensive description of its geography. The land, he says, provided its people with everything. Flocks of various kinds fed on its lush meadows. Timber and other metals were found in abundance, among which was a precious material that Greeks knew only by name, orichalcum, that Plato assures Atlantis had in large quantities. Animals of different kinds roamed the countryside, and even elephants were to be found in large numbers. Exotic fruits now hard to find, liquid gum and cocoa palms, pomegranates and citrus were also found in abundance, and Atlantis enjoyed the innumerable goods of their island paradise. The capital city was a marvel to behold, built in perfect concentric circles of land where water moats connected with bridges leading to the royal palace a palace that each successive king had improved during his reign until it had become an abode of magnitude and beauty. The outermost cycle of the city opened to a channel, big enough for the largest vessels to pass. From afar, Atlanteans could see merchant ships from across the world carrying their goods, while minor waterways were opened to connect every part of the city in a single network of distribution. Towers were built from stones that were white, black and red, weaving the colors together with natural grace. And just like Athens had its celebrated temple of Athena, the Parthenon, the Acropolis of Atlantis was devoted to Poseidon, the sea god, from whose sons its kings were descended. No one knows exactly why but eventually the Atlanteans fell away from their connection to the divine and became concerned with material wealth as greed took over their soul. Extending ever westwards, they began fighting a brutal war against Athens, which, like we said, was not the historical Athens, but another that existed 9,000 years before it. The Atlanteans would eventually lose, and the gods punished their arrogance by sinking their island below the waves, where some believe it still remained. Now, what could possibly be so wrong in simply believing an ancient text? After all, the city of Troy was thought to be a fantasy until 1871, when Heinrich Schliemann followed clues from Homer's epics to discover in modern Turkey a city that seemed to fit the descriptions given by the great poet. Why then could Atlantis not be given the same right to pass? 
at least in theory. There must be various reasons for this pushback. Archaeologists, just like the rest of us, don't like being told they're wrong, especially by non-experts. But maybe there's more, as the reasons for their denial might go deeper and into the very foundations of Western civilization, the idea of progress. Because you see, for us, history is not simply a series of events, but a story, one that tells of an ever-perfecting species that through its many mistakes learns to become better, not just technically, but morally. It's almost like we've learned to plot the data entries of historical events on a line that goes ever upwards, while periods of regression like the Middle Ages are explained away as local anomalies, temporal setbacks to an ever-increasing trajectory upward. But what if we were to find evidence of a civilization that existed 10,000 years ago, just like Plato suggested, that was just as advanced as ours, or even more? How could we possibly fit this point to the line model of progress? Well, we probably couldn't, and we would, to our dismay, have to find another. And how could this new model look? One option seems to be a parabola, a U-shaped curve that peaks around 10,000 BC on one end and 2,000 AD on the other, while somewhere in the middle it falls to its lowest point. What this would imply, however, is the existence of two great singularities, one in the very distant past and another in the near future. The second one, of course, the one set in the future, would fit well with our narrative of progress and was in fact prophesized by scientists like Raymond Kurzweil, who believed that soon a breakthrough in computer technology will finally set our course towards the best of possible world. But how about this other singularity? If indeed this were the case, and an incredible level of progress was achieved in the distant past by an island off the Iberian coast, just like who we hope there will be one in the near future, where did it all go wrong? Why did the Atlanteans disappear? Plato says that Atlanteans ultimately fell victims to the forces of nature that enveloped their island with great tidal waves until it sunk and become the stuff of legend. But why did their technology not help them in that moment of crisis? And if this was their fate, what guarantees that ours will be different? What Atlantis may suggest, therefore, is something way scarier. A third model, not linear or curved, but wave-like. One that goes up and down and up again for an infinity, legitimizing the Egyptian priest's conviction about the eternal cycle of growth and decay. Because as counterintuitive as it sounds to the modern mind, the theory of eternal circle would be consistent with nearly all traditions of the ancient world. Even during their short reign, the Aztecs were convinced that our world had already gone through four of these destructions. The Hindus, the Babylonians and even the Vikings believed that the world passed through an infinite series of self-similar cycles, each curiously adding to a number, 432,000 years, a number that is often seen hidden in the Apocalypse of St. John. The Greeks were no different, and according to classical scholar John Burry, the theory of world cycles was so current among the Greeks, it could be described as the orthodox theory of cosmic time. Most people living in Europe today can only relate to war and destruction as a distant memory, and have thus a strange reassurance that their generation, and for reasons they cannot really explain, will never have to go through what all other generations did. But deep down, we must know how lucky we have been so far, and that our luck can always, at least in principle, run out. 
No one predicted the great war that swept through Europe at the beginning of the last century. And no one can predict the future as things stand. And so, our constant mockery of people who believe in Atlantis might not be coming from a place of security, but anxiety, as it might be this suppressed knowledge that makes Atlantis so scary and so interesting.